Welcome to the Seed Family Podcast, where we explore natural, homeschooling, gentle parenting, simple living, and family adventure. I'm Rachel Rainbolt, the Sage Parenting Coach, coming to you from the Pacific Northwest, where I live wild and free in connection with my three wildlings and the papa bear in our fixer-upper on the beach. This is episode 53, and today I'm here with Dr. William Stixrud and Ned Johnson talking about the self-driven child. Dr. Stixrud is a clinical neuropsychologist, lecturer, author, faculty member, and founder of the Stixrud Group, and Ned Johnson is a tutor geek, author, speaker, and founder of Prep Matters, and together they wrote the book, The Self-Driven Child. So join us around the campfire, and let's get living the family life of our dreams. share a review of the bucket system class. The bucket system is the soft structure I designed to implement self-directed learning, internal motivation, executive functioning, and collaboration into daily living with children in a tactile way. If the things you hear in this podcast episode resonate with you, then you will love the bucket system. Like Melissa, who recently shared, we started the bucket system and it has changed our world. We no longer nag our son to do his normal morning and evening routines. He tells us when he needs or is ready for support in his school topics. He loves being in control of his day and knowing what to expect. If you want to learn more, head to rachelrainbolt.com slash bucket dash system. And now the adventure of the week. When my firstborn turned 15, one of her first acts as a freshly minted 15-year-old was to get her learner's permit, and we are now living in a world where my baby is driving. Whoa. I was surprised by how terrifying the experience was at first, the fear I felt for her safety, and the lack of control I felt in that passenger seat. And so we simplified and started small with empty parking lots and then quiet residential neighborhoods and now busy city streets growing both in our skills, trust, and confidence with every acceleration and turn. It feels like all of the mindfulness and parenting and homeschooling is culminating in this adventure for us right now. I love how when we allow ourselves to be fully present in any moment with our kids, we can really feel the weight of the moment as it's unfolding. Our little obsession right now is a couple of family read-aloud books that we have been loving. Manana Land, which touches on immigration, and Green Glass House, which touches on adoption. Both stories were just fantastic, and we all, including all three of my kids and myself, just hung on every chapter. I'll link to both books in the show notes, but I'll also add that we read both books through Libby, which is our library's ebook app. When I see a recommendation I think might be good for us, special thanks to my friend Julie Bogart, who recommended both of these gems, I read the description and some reviews on Amazon, and if I think it will be a good fit for us, I add it to our Libby Holds list, which is like reserving it. Then once it becomes available, I check it out through the app and it's sent to my Kindle where we, where we read and enjoy it every night. If you want to see photos and videos of the bucket system or my teen driving or us reading, then head on over to sage.family on Instagram and follow along. self-driven child, the science and sense of giving your kids more control over their lives, Dr. William Stixrud and Ned Johnson provide the, provide the hard science, inspiring anecdotes, and practical how-tos to get you out of your kid's way. This book is a powerhouse that I enthusiastically recommend. So I am so excited to have Bill and Ned here today. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, nice to be here. 
Will you each take a few minutes just to introduce yourselves and share a bit about who you are and what you're passionate about and how you came to this work? Sure. So this is Bill Sixrood, and um, I'm, I'm a neuropsychologist, and for the last 36 years or so, I've tested kids who have various kinds of difficulty with learning or attention or emotions or social stuff, and I just try to uh, I evaluate them, try to figure out what's wrong, what's right, how to help them. Uh, I've been an enthusiastic practitioner of meditation for 47 years, and I played rock and, in a rock, rock and roll band most of my life. I have two adult children and three grandchildren and a fourth one due next month. Oh, congrats. Thanks. <laughs> and how about you, Ned? Uh, well, since uh, 1993, I've been a test prep geek helping kids battle uh, and prepare prepare and battle, prepare for and battle a sta uh, an alphabet of standardized tests of uh, SAT and ACT and GRE and GMAT, LSAT, all that kind of jazz uh, and doing this one-on-one -on -one for somewhere north of 40,000 hours. I've spent a lot of time kind of in the trenches trying to figure out what stresses kids out and what helps to be less stressed and what um, kid, what helps kids feel motivated. Uh, and so for me, my great passion is uh, trying to help kids be successful in pursuing goals that are meaningful to them. Uh, I have a teenage daughter who's a junior in high school and a son who just started his freshman year, his first year of college. Okay, I'm going to kick us off here with a quote from your book. We think of chronic stress in children and teenagers as the societal equivalent of climate change, a problem that has been building over generations. What is creating this stress? Well, I think that there's a lot of things. And the simplest thing is simply that, that, uh, that adults sleep somewhere between two and three hours less than we did um, a hundred years ago and, and, and children and teenagers sleep increasingly less. And if you, if, if you knew that the average high school senior sleeps, uh, needs six and a, needs nine and a quarter hours of sleep, not to feel tired and uh, gets six and a half. I mean, you, you don't have to go much farther than that. to think that this, this causes a heck of a yeah. lot of, of problems. So the, 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 the list includes uh, sleep, Certainly, technology always makes the world go faster, makes it more stressful, creates more work. And, um, and certainly, income inequality is, is, is a big factor in the amount of anxiety that kids have. The increase in perception of scarcity in terms of, of resources of getting into good colleges. Um, Ned, do you want to add on to Yeah, and I think, I, I think um, you know, one way to think about um, – Stress disorders um, occur when people are chronically at a level of stress that exceeds their capacity to, to handle it. Um, and, and so when, if, you're, if you feel chronically overwhelmed, if you feel um, powerless, resigned, you know, we know that um, all these things that Bill mentioned are all things that elevate stress. And things that, that decrease stress, you know, sleep, exercise, you know, time with friends, you know, laughing, you know, all those kind of things. We, we, increasingly, people have more inflows of stress and fewer outflows of stress. And so oftentimes people are looking around to point to this one thing when oftentimes it can be, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back doesn't look like much because it's a piece of straw. And so I think a lot of times people are looking for something monumentally different when it's it's this kind of rising tide um, of 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 all the things that Bill mentioned of, of of stress 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 and and we haven't figured out a way to kind of pull the plug uh, out the bottom and, and and release some release some of the stress from our lives and our bodies and our brains in a healthy enough way and so when when we think about um, the tools that are that when the self driven child are things that are designed to decrease the inflows and 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 increase the outflows of stress. Oh, I, I was going to say that I, I think part of our concern is that m many of the families that we work with have the idea, seem to have the idea, many of the kids that we work with, that the most important outcome of their childhood and adolescence is where they go to college. And almost anything is, is, is worth it if it gets you into an elite enough college. And what, what, what we know about brain development is, is we, we don't want, if they don't have to be, we don't want kids to be chronically tired, chronically stressed, chronically unhappy, because it changes the brain in a way that just makes them more vulnerable later on. And we want kids to be as successful as they want to be as adults, 
but we also want them to have a brain that's going to be capable of enjoying their success, which is why, why we compare it to, to uh, the, the, the climate change or, or, or repeated blows to the head. I mean, it, it's, it really is a, a, stre- a crisis of stress. Yeah, and it seems to me, from my perspective, that like the the parenting style and the school um, culture or demands have been increasing along while those things like sleep have been decreasing. Is that has that been your experience or your observation yep. as well? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Ditto. Yeah. Well, so many parents subconsciously experience their children as an extension of themselves, but they are their own sovereign beings. And to really free ourselves to respect our children's agency, we have to face this fact. As you put it in the book, it's your child's life, not yours. How have you two seen that dynamic play out when a parent just refuses to secede ownership of a child's life? You see it in crises. You see it in things going really, really poorly. Um, you know, we, we were we were given a, one of the last talks that we gave around Silicon Valley, who, who they've had us out there a number of times, and uh, uh, and uh, we think of a lot of our talks being directed at, at towards parents of teenagers, because um, that's where a lot of things pop up. And but the, there were a bunch of folks there who kids were much younger, and this mom came up afterwards and she said, you know, should 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 we should I be worried about my daughter? Um, we kind of fight about school all the time, or maybe this was right after COVID started. And she, she described that her, her five or six year old daughter had drawn a picture of a meteorite squashing mommy. And we thought you might want to back off a little. (laughs) Yeah. She said, should I be worried? (laughs) Well, (laughs) get a bigger (laughs) umbrella. Yeah. That that was a a (laughs) webinar we did for the people out in uh, Bainbridge Island in Washington. We had we were supposed to go out uh, to, to Bainbridge Island, but because of COVID, we we did it uh, this webinar uh, via Zoom. But uh, yeah, we we see this. And I, I, it plays out in different ways. There are some kids who I mean, I, I used to do a lot of psychotherapy, Rachel, and I, and I commonly would see a thirty year old or forty year old, and I'd sit down in the first session and say, "How can I help?" And they'd say, "Well, I feel like I spent the first thirty or forty years of my life trying to live up to other people's expectations. Now I'm trying to figure out, figure out what's important to me." And, and so, so there, there are people who go along, there are people who go along with the idea that, that really I'm supposed to do what my parents expect of me. And the other kids will, will fight it from, from the get-go and create the kind of stress and ch- challenge that Neb was just referring to. So it goes different ways, but the, the most beautiful thing for, for me is, 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 is this idea that it's really, it's the kid's life, and that's the beautiful thing about it. We don't, and ultimately, most parents want their kids to have a life that they want as, as they grow as they grow up into adults. They, they don't want them to be chronically miserable or dissatisfied. They want them to have a life that they want. And I think that from that perspective, our job is not to make them turn out a certain way. Our job is to help them figure out who they want to be and support them in developing the life that they want. Mm. You advocate for parents to step into the role of consultant instead of enforcer. Talk to us about the difference. Well, I, I think that, that um, you know, when I, I've worked with underachievers for most of my career, and I've always asked them, if you don't turn in an assignment, who's most upset? And invariably, the kid says, my mom. Then I say, who's next most upset? He says, my dad, then my teacher, then my tutor. And the, the kid's never on the list. And, and I th- th- think that so often I go to school meetings. Um, and where a, a learning specialist will say it takes two learning specialists and a tutor and mom on top of the kid all the time in order to get them to do any, any work. And that's kind of idea where, where uh-huh. our job is to pressure the kid or the, to be the kid's manager or boss or enforcer. Um, it just doesn't work in terms of supporting what we really know is important, which is the sense of autonomy. This is my life. We don't want to take responsibility for something that's the kids because we weaken them. And one of the wisest things anybody ever told me was don't work harder to help a kid solve their problems than the kid does because you're going to weaken them because they're going to think that the solution to the problems is within you and not within them. Yes. 
Yeah, it really frees you up to just kind of love and enjoy and support your kid. I have this class called the bucket system that I use to help homeschooling families to bring a little soft structure. And one of the things I talk a lot about in that class is it, that if you lean too far forward, then your kids yeah. keep leaning back. It's that like over-functioning, mm-hmm. under-functioning mm-hmm. cycle or pursuer, <laughs> distancer. I've heard you guys talk about it in terms of like if you if you are expending eighty units of effort, then your kid will expend mm-hmm. well, that, that, twenty. That's certainly my experience of in working with kids with ADHD and learning disabilities, and where I see that the adults are working yeah. so much harder. And the crazy thing is, once you realize it, and you realize that, you, that you're working harder, and and you, you say, you know, I, I love you too much to weaken you, and I and if I keep doing this, and I put it, I'm putting most of the energy in to try to help you with this, that that I'm just gonna I'm gonna weaken you, and I, I care too much about you to do that. The energy almost always you do that. It almost kid almost always steps up to the plate quickly. Yeah, that's been my observation and my experience too. And they learn so much more in stepping up to the plate. And they when they do actually attain those accomplishments that they've chosen to you yeah. know engage in, they feel a sense of pride and accomplishment that they don't get when the parent is the one doing well, most of the work. I, 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 I always I, I always love when people talk about you know the you know, kids getting trophies for, you know, most improved, you know, trier kind of thing, (laughs) you know, where, where often, you know, we, we so often, you know, we, we so often, you know, you know, figuratively pick up children and, and carry them 26 miles or 26.1 and then put them down from the finish line and should have, you know, shush, move them across the finish line and go, yay. And it's like, you know, if you've done the work, you know, if you've earned it, right. You know, and yeah. uh, just I mean to you know uh, uh, wh- whether it's you know something that you've earned that's 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 short of perfect is better than than getting something that's perfect that you didn't make for yourself because it doesn't wire your brain in the way you want it to. You know, and, and yes, and and that that idea about parent as consultant is something that. Uh, I wrote an article about it in 1986 because I was doing therapy with these families, and and so so often the the mother would say it's like World War III trying to get the kid to do any work, you know. And I said, T- tell your kid I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And I just uh, homework doesn't seem to contribute to learning very much. And with homeschooling, it's a different thing. But and, but but still the same the same thing in terms of of of, of who who's where's the energy coming from. If all the energy comes from an adult, mm-hmm. the, that the kid will spend very little. In part, because that's the way kids manage their anxiety; they let somebody else worry about it. Um, but, but, yeah. um, but uh, so I just I, I, I suggested tell your kid I love you too much to fight with you about your work. I'm willing to be your consultant. I'm willing to do anything I can to help you. So t- we offer all the help a kid wants, but we don't try to force it down their throat. And the, there's a there's a story in the book about my son when he was in fifth sixth grade. Uh, and my kid is like a, a lot of boys, someone who kind of does everything last minute. He's a little scattered and he's, you know, he's, he's, he's getting, he's getting better. But when he was again, middle school and, and my wife, who's a, who's a very serious academic, she teaches Latin. She's, she's one of these people who just, you know, does school well and, you know, for herself and for teaching. And she was helping him and, and, and there was an assignment that wasn't done. It got, didn't get handed in. So, something wasn't as it, as it should be. And my wife turned to my son a little, a little, you know, a little irked and said, why didn't you do whatever, hand it in, whatever it was. And and he, you know, kind of irked and re- response turned back and sort of shot at her because you didn't remind me to. And I said, oh, boy. OK, wait. So, so, I, I, right, so I'm like the guy in the middle of a basketball time out time. Hold, hold up, everybody. OK, to go back to your corners. And I I kind of lean on him. And I said, look, pal, I said, I said, first of all, we, we don't throw mom under the bus. That's not good idea right and and you know because this is this is your work this is your work and it's okay if you forget it but but let's figure out what the solution is here and, and then i go over to her and I, I said sweetheart i mean you can kind of understand why he might it's not cool but you can understand why he might feel that way because my wife is one of those people who is just she's you know executive functions coming out of her ears right so she could run her schedule and my schedule the family schedule my son's schedule you know bill's schedule rachel if you need someone to outsource we get she's very reasonable rate <laughs> right but of course just because she is you know is a you know at that point you know 40 year old brain could do things that a you know a, a 12 year old boy is not doing it's just he needed to do this on his own and so we made this really concerted effort 
we're in the middle of writing this, writing this book to really step back and say, no, no, we trust that you're going to do this. Do we think it's going to be perfect? No. And, you know, he would get 52s on tests because he studied the wrong chapter. But boy, he learned to pay attention to what chapter should I study? And, uh, you know, it, it, he's he, now I f- can feel confident that he's off, you know, at college with fistfuls of our money. Right. And that he, 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 he can do this on his own because we've left him with support, but we've left this to, to do mm-hmm. it on his own, where if we had been on top of him for the last six years, I would be, I'd be checking on him every single night because I'd be so afraid that he wasn't doing school because I, I would have had not, I would have not had the experience nor he of having him do school for himself. Mm, yeah. I mean, it, it is true that kids sort of borrow their parents' prefrontal cortex and executive <laughs> functioning skills and all that. Like they kind of tap into it like an external hard drive. But even in doing that, you can still like give them the lead in that. For example, if you see your kids upset, you can you can connect with them and offer a hug. You know, would you like a hug? Mm-hmm. And, and that's them still tapping into your support without you taking over. And you know, the older they get, the less and less they need to tap into your external hard drive. Right, right, right. You know, when, when my son was little, it was maybe six. My son has ADHD, and um, and when he was little, maybe six or so, that um, <laughs> you know, we'd say, "Honey, it's time to clean your room," and he was always happy to do it. But he'd just be—he'd get overwhelmed with it about thirty seconds and just be lying, lying down flat on his back. You know, just, <laughs> and so I'd say, let, let, I say, let's take duct tape and just make you and put down and make your room into quarters, and then you can just do move from one little square to the other. And, and with mm-hmm. that structure, he was—he was happy to do it. And then I'd say, you know, as you get older, we're going to be able to do this with your mind. We won't need, we won't need the duct tape. And if he was mm-hmm. fighting me on it, I wouldn't have done it. But he did, you know. But yeah. he, he welcomed you know, my, and, and I think that the kids benefit as we model and show them strategies that work. It's just that if we're modeling things for them, we're showing them, we're trying to help them, and they're fighting us. We don't want to double down and, and, and try and try to try to fight harder and try to ram stuff down their throat. Um, yes, it's I, exactly that. I, I picture this pile, Bill, this enormous pile of all the stuff in one quadrant of his room. And then the next day, she <laughs> took the other corner. <laughs> well, you, you, know, it, um, you know, his sister, who doesn't, who doesn't have ADHD, you know, just, just always hate I mean, Her room was, as a high school student looked like a schizophrenic. So I, I, <laughs> once a month, she, she was happy to have me come in and, and, and clean, clean her room up with her. And, and she, it was actually fun to do it. But uh, I, I think my, my son turned into somebody who's incredibly organized and planful, and his, his, his space is, is really neat. And I don't I don't know if it had to do with, with the um, if it had anything to do with the, with the duct tape or not. Uh, but um, so the, yeah, the basic one of the wisest things anybody ever said to me, and I don't remember who it was, but somebody said one of the things that, I, that you said the best thing about raising adolescents is when they come home from school. You get to see who they're deciding to be. And with homeschool kids, it's the same thing. Every day, you get to see really who they're deciding to be. And I think that's what we want to support is is who kids want to be. Oh, yes. Okay, so we're we're telling you to lean back to give your kids more space to lean forward into their own life. And I'm going to be honest, you're likely to feel anxiety in that space before the trust and confidence really (laughs) blossom. (laughs) And managing your own anxiety, that is one of the most important things you will do as a parent. In the book, you guys really emphasize the importance of being a non-anxious presence for your child, which I love. Can you elaborate on what that means and why it's important? Yes. Sure. Sure. I mean, we got we got this term from a guy named Edwin Freeman. So we didn't make this up. We we borrowed it. Uh, and, and he is a he was a rabbi. He was a consultant. He worked with families and organizations, churches, synagogues, and and he made the point that he had the observation that things work better when the person or people who are in charge aren't overly reactive. They aren't overly emotional, in part because when we think about, you, you talked about kids using parents as their external hard drives, they also use them as, as working memory, as, as problem solving, right? And if we if we think about really quickly the prefrontal cortex in which resides those executive functions, so the ability to plan and organize, to, to, to put things in perspective, to find creative solutions, we want, when, when we're in our right minds, that part of our brain is running the, is running the show, as opposed to 
the 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 stress detecting threat detecting part of the brain called the amygdala and so in many ways it's it's a little bit of a battle of of you know it's like inside out who's in charge of the brain right so when things are going well our prefrontal cortex runs things and even if when things are stressful it'll dampen down the stress response of the amygdala and so we know that when parents or, or, or teachers or leaders can, when things are a little intense, when they don't, when they're not overly emotionally reactive, that calm pervades the people around them and their prefrontal cortex to stay online. And, the, and it helps all of us, including our kids, to find solutions to our problems. If our kid comes home and is really upset or, you know, get, gets off the computer is really upset and we become, oh, my gosh, and we get as excited as they are, then no one is really thinking clearly. And a quick point that you're, you, you mentioned before of how it's hard for us to lean back um, so that our, our kids, you know, can, don't, don't, can, can lean forward is that one of the most stressful things to a human nervous system is having a low sense of control. And so we tend to feel less stressed when we feel more control, but, but it, it's a bit of a zero sum game that if my kid is struggling with this homework, right, I want to jump in and try to try to solve this. There's a beautiful, uh, people have seen the, the second screenagers movie where there's a little bit from about our book in there. And then a, a research in Jesse Borelli, who's UC Irvine. And she did this really neat experiment where it was kids doing a, a by design, a really difficult, called digital puzzle and they had their moms there and their moms were there for emotional support and the only instruction was don't give them help don't give your kid help just just sit there but don't give them help well they designed this thing to be really frustrating for the kids so the kids are getting a little worked up and it was so hard for the moms to not feel distressed because their kids were in distress to a one the moms jump, no, try, try twist it this way. No, move, no, move, no, move it over here, left. And every single one of them, because they love their kids and they didn't, they didn't want their kids to be upset nor themselves, they jumped in. Here's, mm -hmm. the, here's the interesting part. Both participants are wearing heart rate monitors. As the, ki as the moms start to offer advice, their stress goes down because they now they no longer feel powerless. They're no longer sitting on their hands. They, they feel more in control. But as they jump in to lower their stress to feel more in control, their kid's stress goes up. Mm. So it's a tall order because we're wired to care about our kids and not want to see them suffer. But the, the literature is really compelling that if we can work as hard, do the things that, that help us be non-anxious during a time that's difficult, it allows our kids to think more clearly themselves and, and, and as much as possible solve problems for themselves rather than looking to us to solve those problems for them. Oh, that is so profound. I I like to think of it or visualize it as like being the lighthouse in your child's emotional storm. Like the lighthouse doesn't try to control the storm. <laughs> it's just this steady light like presence that the kid can sort of help to use to navigate back home, right? Like back to the safe harbor. That's and that's mm -hmm. the, the image that I call to mind when I start to feel that tug. <laughs> and Tina Tina Payne Bryson made the point that you can't be the harbor if you are part of the storm. Yes. And we, we refer to our, our goal. We, we suggest that a really good, ideally, that a home is a safe base. I mean, life, life outside in you know, school or work or wherever you go and whatever sports, whatever, it's stressful enough that when you come home, ideally things are calm. And it's a, it's a safe haven to, to recover. And you know, we, we talk about research on what's called stress contagion, where you, you pick up the stress of the other people around you, and also calm contagion. You know, that you're around calm people, you pick that up. And the other really important thing, Rachel, is that when, when we're calm, it's much easier, and this is kind of related to what Net was saying, it's much easier to support autonomy in our, in our, in our kids. And the main thesis of, of the self-driven child is that is that kids need more sense of control over their own lives because when you have a sense of control, it's never saying you're much it, life is much less stressful, and it's much easier for us to support autonomy in kids if we're calm ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you guys describe that negative feedback loop, I think, in the book where, and I see it a lot too, where a parent feels anxious. And so to, to give that anxiety an outlet, they, they control their kid. You know, like you said, the control lowers the parent's anxiety, but then that compels the kid to rebel, which compels <laughs> right, the adult right. to control. Right, right. <laughs> and they were just stuck in this loop. But when we're respecting our kid's autonomy and acting as a non-anxious presence, we we can allow like natural consequences to do the bulk of the heavy lifting and just let them have their experiences and make mistakes and learn from them and then just be those loving arms of non-judgmental acceptance that they can always return to. It's you know? so true. And I, and I think about this, I mean, you know, I was trying to think of the adult perspective. I mean, imagine if you, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you make a, you make, you make a, you make a big presentation of work or you're trying to make a big sale and it doesn't go well. And you come home, you've been so excited for it to go well. And your spouse looks in, so how was your day? And you're like, Ugh. And then they start grilling you. Well, did you, did you try this? She said, what if you'd done this, right? And giving you all the things that you mm. should have done, right? Oh, my gosh, if you don't just want to turn on your heel and walk out the door and go 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 have dinner with someone else's family, right? <laughs> you know? Because to Bill's point, we, we, we all deserve the chance to have home be a safe base, in, in part because we go back to where we started with that stress. It's it's not that we want kids to have lives that never have stress because because stress is what we experience when we're when we're testing the limits of our ability and that's how we grow. But without getting broken, we need the ability to stretch stress our to stretch ourselves with some stress, but then have a place to predictably be able to recover from that stress. And we really should have that be home. I mean, in a perfect world, school's not, you know, or for, we wouldn't want places other than home be, to be less stressful. It's sort of like we've got that backwards, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, so I want to talk about motivation because in the homeschooling community, this is a frequent topic of conversation. Will you share with us the key ingredients to motivation? Yes. It's, it's, Social it's, media and video games. <laughs> right. and, and, and lots of and big, big, uh, big dollar rewards. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, th that really it, it's this this role. Probably the most important thing is a sense of autonomy and supporting a kid's sense of autonomy, as opposed to, to thinking that somehow we're supposed to be able to make a kid want what he doesn't want or make him not want what he wants. And every place we look to try to understand. So they'll say a minute about, about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation because I think it's an important thing to clarify. Well, so so we, in our book, we, we, we talk about mainly about this intrinsic motivation, this internal motivation to work hard, to develop yourself, to develop your skills, and as opposed to kind of enlisting cooperation, getting, things to, getting kids to do things that, that we want them to do or we feel like we need them to do. And so but that's that's a different story. Enlisting cooperation, in some ways, is a different story. But in terms of getting kids developing that intrinsic motivation, every place we looked to to, to figure out how, how that happens, all the arrows pointed in the direction of autonomy. The the, the idea is you have to have a sense that this is your life, um, in in order to really be self motivated. Ned, do you want to talk about self determination or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you you. you the, Particularly when we think about school, you know, we we all want our kids to work hard. Um, but to echo Bill's point about you know enlisting cooperation versus their intrinsically working at things, more even more than wanting kids to to work hard at school, at music, at, at whatever sports, whatever they're doing, ideally we, they would want to work hard, right? So they're doing it because it's meaningful to them. And so the, 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 the most, one of the most supported models in all of psychology is what's called self-determination theory. And it's a model of how do people become intrinsically motivated? What's the formula? And the formula is it just holds that folks need three things. They need a sense of competency. Uh, they need a sense of relatedness and they need a sense of autonomy. So if, if you don't feel competent, if you feel like you're the worst person in math or soccer or whatever, you don't want to work harder to get better. You just, you want to do something else altogether and just chuck that out the window. So that's where they need support by mom or dad or a teacher, tutor, or older brother, or coach or whatever. Just saying, it's all right, no, you, you know, you're not good at this yet, but you'll get there. We sort of we can sort of nurture them along. But also 
we need it. We need this relatedness. Would they need to feel connected to, you know, mom, dad, the, the coach, you know, the, the activity. So, so, so it's th- th- those personal connections are everything. I mean, in, in school, this is why, you know, good teachers are worth their weight in gold because they don't get kids to work hard. They help kids want to work hard, which is, you know, a hugely important qualitative difference. And then the last thing, as Bill points out, is autonomy, that I need the sense that these are my goals, that these are my life, that, you know, that I have a say, that my choices matter. Because I'll get up early to meet your goals, Rachel, so long as there's, you know, something in it for me. But in terms of me being intrinsically motivated, it, it, I, need, I need to have the subjective sense of, of autonomy. And we spoke with Edward Deasy, who was one of the guys who put this together, you know, in the 80s. And he said, it's, our, our feeling is if you're going to lean into one of these, that, the, that, that autonomy is the, the most important one. It, it, do we have that right? And he said, un- unquestionably, unquestionably, mm-hmm. in part because, you know, year after year after year, the amount of autonomy the kids feel in their lives, particularly if they're in school systems, has gone down and gone down and gone down. I mean, things like social media externalize things. And so we, our kids are, are too often growing up in a world where um, things that used to be unstructured play are now adult supervised activities right and and so many things are directed and if we can think about you know i, I know you mentioned when we went for the start this uh, conversation about the great work of peter gray and mm-hmm. and play and in a perfect world life life continues to be as much about play as possible um i'm you don't know this but i'll, I'll share this with you bill's been hearing about this for 15 years i've been rebuilding a stone wall in upstate new york and you can't, your listeners can't tell by looking at them. I'm a massively powerful five foot 10, 159 pounds. So yeah, if there's a guy who's built to move heavy rocks, I'm the guy. But it is so much fun because when I was five and six and seven and visiting my grandparents in the summer, I would sit there and build little dams and forts. And I just loved, loved, loved doing it. And I've never lost that love. And so I spent, you know, a good six hours yesterday finishing up the last segment of the wall that I'm doing for the summer. And, and, and we would allow kids as much autonomy, whether it's, you know, it's coding, it's rock climbing, it's small engine repair, it's whatever they're into. Because as Bill pointed out before, you can't make kids want what they don't want. But the things that they're into, if they're working hard at it, they're developing brains that are, are, are ready to and able to and, and excited about working hard. Well, most of the listeners are on sort of the self-directed learning or unschooling path. And this is like our jam right here. This is like our, yeah. our why. And I think in the homeschooling community, it can be easy to allow anxiety to, to pull you into a very, like you taking ownership and controlling and mandating sort of space. And this right here, at least for me, and I know for a lot of people that I align with this helps to keep our compasses set like all of this stuff that you're talking about okay can i can i ask bill to talk about uh his his rock and roll and, and where that started and how how important oh, that yes, was Yes, please well so in high school uh, i i graduated from high school with a 2.8 grade point average and and uh I and then that, you amounted to nothing well, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At that time, I only needed a 2.5 to get into the University of Washington. I still kick myself for having done the extra work to get a 2.8, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, overachieving. But I, I, I don't think I, I don't remember ever getting past 75, page 75 or even 25 in a book in high school. I don't remember ever turning an assignment in on time. I don't remember getting anything back that wasn't graded down, at least a letter grade for being late. And it just wasn't my priority. You know, I didn't. I didn't want to flunk, uh, although I did flunk English the, the, the first quarter of my senior year. But I, I didn't want to flunk. But I did. But rock and roll. I was in. A, it was the most important thing to me. I was in a band, and it was, I just. I just lived for it. And every night, I tell myself, "Okay, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll go play music. I'll, 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 work, I'll learn a song, or I'll practice my my organ, uh, and 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 then I'll do a homework." And I just never. I, I come out of my music room two and a half hours later or three hours later, having no idea what time it was. And just mm-hmm. and, and and thinking maybe thinking that it's, it's eight o'clock when it's really nine quarter or ten or something, and and what happened with me is that, I, well I, I I read some years ago that this guy named Reed Larson who studies how how children turn into self motivated adolescents and adults, and he concluded it's not through dutifully doing their homework assignments, it's through what what he called the passionate pursuit of pastimes, 
And he pointed out that if a kid is, whether it's building Legos when they're three years old or whether, whether it's it, they're, they're practicing a sport or music or dance or art or coding, rock climbing, whatever it is, where you're passionately involved in that flow experience of deeply engagement, high energy, high focus, high determination, low stress. That's the beautiful brain state for, for accomplishing in the adult world. And what I realized is that I, my father died my senior year of high school at very young. And so I, 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 I finished high school with a 2.8, and I started college two months later with a, with a 4.0. Um, and and it, wasn't, it wasn't maturated. I think my father's dying what woke me up. But I'm very mm-hmm. confident that I developed a, a brain that once school became important to me, that I could go pedal to the metal. And so when I, work yeah. with, when I work with kids now who aren't very motivated for school, as long as they're doing something, they're doing something that, and video games may or may not count. I'm not positive about that. But, but anything that requires that, that's, that a lot of full engagement where they have to kind of keep themselves practicing to get better and better and better, I say, I don't worry about you. I said, I think, I think eventually you're going to probably need to take school more seriously than you do now. But I'm not worried because I know when you do – you're going to be able. To, you're going to have a brain that's going to know how to go pedal to the metal. Yes, we will often talk on this podcast and in my writing and whatnot about how you can learn anything that you need, sort of through the doorway of your interests, and yeah. this sort of mm-hmm. adds a whole other layer to that. I mean, whatever your interest is, you can sort of flesh out and touch on all these other skills and areas of learning. You know, like rock and roll, like you can study history through that. You can write songs. There's writing in there. There's so much math and musical theory. There's, you know, I mean, you, you can access all these different areas through the doorway of an interest. And I love that, that everything that you just talked about just sort of fleshes that out and adds this whole other layer to it. Well, it's absolutely true. You know, there's a high school here, a very small high school here in D.C., um, that doesn't have any elective. It's all required courses. And, and I've seen kids who... Do to the, the, the kids who've been complete slackers, you know, through ninth and tenth grade, they, or even eleventh grade. They, they 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 do two or three years of high school in a year, and so, I think so much of our fear as parents, and I, I imagine a lot of homeschooling parents, is that if if, if the kid's not working hard enough, he's going to fall far behind every, everybody else. And what I want people to keep in mind is that so much of academic development is brain development. I mean, you, you could, there's a reason that you have to relearn everything you, you learn in middle school. You, you learn it again in high school. Yes. It, you know, and, and, and certainly, almost virtually everything, with the exception of a foreign language accent, is easier to learn with a more mature brain. So th- that, that's why it's safe. I mean, the, the main goal for me in writing Subdiv and Child was to help parents understand that it's safe to trust kids and not feel that we have to force them all the time or they have to worry about them all the time. And that if they aren't, if they haven't committed to full effort it, 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 when, when they're five or when they're seven or the 14, we don't have to get real panicked about it be, be, because, you know, I, I've seen kids, once they decide that school's important, they, they just go, they, they just go nuts. And then they start, I, I, we, I saw it, there's a story in the book about a kid who literally flunked all his classes in ninth grade, all his classes the first semester of 10th grade. He meets with a counselor who says, honey, you know, you're going to need to plan an extra year of high school. And he realized the first time, I'm not going to graduate with my friends. He started going to day school and night school. He graduated on time. Then he went to college and majored in psychology. And, you know, who, and, and so once you respect that this is their life and, and, and not put more energy into they do and, and respect that our motto is that kids want their life to work. Kids are intelligent and they want their life to work. They don't want to fail. And as, as we side with that part of them that wants to, want, wants to do well and we're patient, it works. Yes, I, and I'll share a little personal anecdote. When I was in high school, I remember sitting down, like I, I hated math in high school. And I remember sitting down with my advisor who helps you like build out your schedule. And it was time for me to take statistics. And I said, is that required for graduation? And they said, well, no. And their her exact words were, but you'll never amount to anything if you don't take it. <laughs> <laughs> to which I sort of like narrowed my eyes and declined enrollment in that class. Bless your heart. And then, and then when I was in grad school, 
for family therapy, I had to take a statistics class as part of like to understand the research that was so fascinating to me and was relevant to the work I was doing. And I did amazing. Like I got, I got straight A's in grad school. I I loved it. I found it so fascinating. I found it so easy. My brain was clearly ready for it. I was highly motivated to learn it and understand it. It had context for me. It had meaning and I excelled at it. So I just like another little anecdote to add to your stack of like when, when a person is ready and motivated, they can learn any of this stuff that's completely right and you know m- most adults even in their professional life don't use anything beyond sixth grade math yes. so, so the idea that we have to panic if our kids aren't are getting through through calculus in high school it's just it's just and, and you know that the only kids that really need to do that are kids who want a, a really a quantitative career um but uh yeah and i i see this all the time the kid the kids i work with and and uh, my message to a lot of kids is that you're you are going to want to be a math major, but you're going to be able to pass statistics. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Well, okay, so adolescence is a pretty cool time of development. Can you fill us in on some of the brain development that's happening during this stage? Sure. Do you want you want to go or you want me to go? Yeah, you go. No, 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 you go first. You're the doctor. Okay, well, just, <laughs> so, so a cu- couple. Of, I mean, certainly, the, the most, the, the most, probably the most important thing, is that the, the, the prefrontal cortex um, just undergoes tremendous development, uh, and it's slow, slow to development. And really, it's important to know that the, that the prefrontal cortex, the cognitive functions of the prefrontal cortex, are not fully mature until 25. And the emotional regulation functions of the prefrontal cortex aren't fully mature until 32, plus minus three. So we're talking about some people 35 years old before they really have their wiring to be really emotionally well regulated. And so the adolescence is really longer than we generally think in terms from a brain development point of view. And so what we see is, is that kids, with, with, because of the slow maturation of the frontal cortex, kids uh, tend to be more impulsive as teenagers. They're more, they're more vulnerable to addiction. And also, they, ha- they tend to overestimate the, the positive outcome of, of a situation. And they kind of minimize, they're aware of, of, the, of the possible negative outcomes. But you know, I, I, I was, <laughs> when I was in eighth grade, I was walking to school um, with, a, with an eighth grade, with a friend. Um, and we had to walk across. We were in junior high uh, that time. Uh, junior high went through ninth grade. And so we walked across the football field to get to school. And we found an unopened bottle of beer. And we put it, in, we, we, we laughed, we, we put it in this girl's lunch bag and, and she opened it up and, and, and we were in the uh, lunchroom waiting for her when she opened it up and we all laughed. And, and I got in a lot of trouble for it, uh, <laughs> but I still think it's pretty funny. <laughs> but but, but the, my point is that, I mean, I, I was probably aware at some level that I'd get in trouble for it, but just, just the prospect of, of sitting and laughing with my friends. Uh, uh, was was so delightful, and that, that that's the that's the other thing to know about adolescent development, which is simply that after 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 uh, puberty, uh, just being around, even thinking about kids, it's like crack cocaine in your brain. I mean, it's just, it, their peers become so powerfully rewarding. You know, and to and to echo Bill's, you know, something said Bill said late, earlier um, that for us the most important. Just to, I, I don't think you can emphasize this enough that the most important outcome. Of, of high school and adolescence is the is really wiring the brain that you're going to carry into adulthood and so you know for, for instance if people become depressed early on it's, it's not that they're doomed to be depressed forever but if you have a major depressive uh, episode before age 18 you just make yourself a lot more likely to experience depression more easily you know I- intermittently throughout life and we just really don't want to have that and so so kids can get i mean i was talking with a student the other day um and she's she's been on this drip feed of being you know high stress push 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 all the time through high school and if she's not chronically busy it makes her anxious that's become mm-hmm. her default resting state if, that i need to be you know busy up to my eyeballs mm-hmm. otherwise I, I i simply can't relax and you know bill, bill and i because we're you know been been around for a while end up with some of the more sophisticated folks in dc We've had a num- we've had a number of billionaires as mutual clients, and it's interesting because not all of them, but for some of them, they have everything in the world you could possibly ask for, except for peace and happiness. 
mm-hmm. because the way they are and the, the, the folks I'm thinking about, and the bill is thinking about as well, who though brilliant and super successful are about as far away from being a non-anxious presence as you can imagine. And so mm-hmm. they're these houses, they're, they're like these house of horrors. I mean, because it's every, they give every toy you can imagine. But no one can ever relax because it's always worried about, you know, the parent, and I won't even say the gender, kind of raging through the household. And so everyone's on pins and needles. And it's just that's that's a heck of a way. That's a heck of a way to grow up as is feeling. I, I need to get straight A's or I'll never go to Ivy League school. And if I never go to Ivy League school, I'll never be successful in life. And, you know, I say this knowing as a test prep guy who helps kids try to get into Ivy League schools and and, and the the the. The balanced way that we think about this is that there's nothing, nothing wrong with wanting to go to Stanford out in your corner, to go to Penn or Princeton. Or there's nothing at all wrong with that because some people are really built that way. The challenge is when people feel that they have to and more importantly, you know, half the country feels that they have to. Because then is that perceived scarcity and the sense that if, you know, n- not that the great things will, will accrue to me if I go to, you know, Penn, but everything will be denied to me if I don't. And, mm-hmm. and most of mental health is changing thinking from I have to to, to I want to because I have okay. to is constant fear. And it's just terrible for brain development where I want to. That's the get up and go. That's the dopamine. That's like, woohoo, let's go. Let's, let's go. Let's go <laughs> try and do this. And that's where we like to be most of the time. So be really intentional and mindful of that like baseline resting state that you sort of calibrate your brain for during adolescence. Yeah, I mean, one way to think about it is that, that you know, a, a healthy nervous system, a healthy stress response activates when there's something intense, right? If it's got to save your life or it's something really demanding and it gets your full attention. But then it should, then a healthy stress response will quickly go back to calm. Right. And so this is kind of back yeah. to the non-anxious presence, a really intense battle, whether figurative or literal. And then you fully relax. And that's what and, and it's different for different people. Some people want each of those things to be you know, to be more or less intense. But we don't we just it's like a soldiers with PTSD. Right. It wasn't the battle that undoes their mental health. It's being hyper vigilant, constantly stressed for weeks or months on end. And so it's perfectly fine to be stressed before a test or asking somebody out or a soccer game or whatever, right? It's just that once that thing's passed, you want to like, okay, and not and not dwell on it and ruminate and kind of make yourself crazy all the time because you're bathing your brain in cortisol that, I don't know, shrinks the hippocampus, you know, the dominant, you know, memory center of your brain. It weakens the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. And, you're, and it's, it's tantamount to kind of slow burn brain damage. And we just rather not do that to ourselves. Yes. Oh, this is such important stuff. And, and that that prefrontal cortex isn't mature until like your early thirties is crazy. And I, I, I'm going to throw my husband under the bus here. And... <laughs> I, th- I think you do sound very young, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> when my, my husband was a pretty extreme driver and then it, we got together when we were quite young and then in like mid to late twenties, it's like all of a sudden he was like calmer and wasn't attributing, you know, nefarious intent to every other car on the road and he was driving slower. And I remember like just noticing that and thinking, oh, something has changed. Like something has like matured in the brain, like at this stage, like I'm so curious what it is. And then like I read your book and I was like, oh, that's what was happening with him and his driving. I just needed to patiently wait for that to well, <laughs> click in. It's funny that they actu- the actuaries who work with insurance companies, they figured this out years ago because you, for years you haven't been able to drive to rent a car until you're 25. <laughs> it's smart. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's also to echo that point, it's, it's also particularly if, you know, your, if you, your listeners are, are folks who have kids who are particularly boys, who, you know, who have ADHD, who are struggling, where, you you know, there's a loose bag of parts and you can see there's potential in there, but golly, it doesn't look too pretty right now, right? <laughs> and it's so, I can remember my wife with my kids say, when is he going to? And I thought, this has nothing to do with his wanting to or his intention or us saying this to him a thousand times. It has to do with his maturation. Remember when he was like, I don't know, third grade or something, and we'd be trying to hustle out the door so we didn't miss the bus, and he'd be tying his shoes 
and then he'd start saying something and he when he'd start when he as soon as he'd start talking he'd stop tying his shoes and my wife is like you know like can't you tie your shoes and talk at the same time and it's like no <laughs> evidence suggests evidence suggests <laughs> it, right yes. and so if you have one of these kids who are like good grief is this kid ever going to get his act together particularly if school for some no so many kids schoolwork can be can be hard stuff this is why we just want to do everything to be patient with our kids and more importantly to help them be patient with themselves because it, we we all tend to compare ourselves to you know kids who are at the who are the you know, our kids to kids at the same age and think oh my gosh he's behind and to to echo the point that Bill made before we we know the growth is not linear there's some people who, you know who shoot up super fast and they're they're as tall as they're going to be at age 12 I was five foot two, and now I mentioned that I'm a massive five ten. I know, but I was five foot two <laughs> until my junior year of high school, right? Oops, mm-hmm. didn't make me a talented athlete. And, and but there are also kids who who intellectually or emotionally they're just not anywhere close to fully baked at age eighteen, and so we worry so much. But give them another two or five or seven years, and you're like, wow, he finally put all those pieces together, and look at that kid now. I, I just got to, to, I got a Christmas card this year from a family where I, I, I tested their three kids uh, two or three times, beginning in the mid nineties, um, and then followed them for years, but I hadn't seen any of them for at least 10 years. I got this Christmas, Christmas card and it's, on the front. It said, you were right. <laughs> I just opened it up. It, it, said, it, said, it, it had a picture of all three kids and their, and their, their spouses. It, it said, they all turned out great. You know, and, and these kids are all a hot mess. The oldest one uh, flunked out of college at least twice because he was got depressed. He couldn't sleep, and, and he had he, he had drop out of college. And uh, there, just this has been the most useful thing I've ever learned about the brain. It was, it was about how slow this prefrontal cortex development is. And as Ned said, if you're male, is probably more likely to be in that plus three than minus three. And if you've got ADHD, add another three or four years on, on, onto that developmental timetable. Um, yeah. So can we can we touch on that? Like, sure. like all of my work has threads of self-directed learning and collaboration. And mainstream parents of neurodivergent children are sometimes quick to dismiss this paradigm shift as only for easy kids. Yeah. Um, and for the record, my family is brimming with neurodiversity. But I'd love for you to share your perspective here. Can kids with ADHD or ASD or learning differences be self-driven children? Absolutely. I mean, it, and I, I think that we, there's a chapter in our book on kids with, with learning disabilities and ADHD and, and autism spectrum disorders. And it's, it, we, the part of the chapter is, is why it's harder for these kids to, to develop, in part because we, 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 they, they, so much is forced on them, so much help is forced on them that they, mm. that they fight. But also um, that, that we make the point you, that kids really can't become independent if they don't have a sense of autonomy. And so, and, and certainly at some point, you, you, you need, that that's, that's what we want to support. And I just, I just working on a report right now on a 17 year old with autism who I initially diagnosed uh, w- w- when he was four years old. And he also has bad dyslexia and learning disabilities. And when I saw him the last time, he was 11, and he, uh, he was just fighting everybody's attempts to help him. He didn't want anybody to let him to, to make him feel like he wasn't good at something. So he, he, he was in a special school, but people were just constantly battling with him. You know, and I, so I, I gave him this lecture about not working harder than he does. And they all buy it and they, they implement it. And at 17, this kid, he lost 100 pounds on his, with completely on his own with no intervention at all just because he decided he wanted to. He's completely independent. His parents said if he had better math sense, he could live on his own. He's completely mm-hmm. he's, he's he's done beautifully in several jobs. Um, he, he could easily have a job, have his own apartment. Just his family helped a little bit with finances. He's completely self driven at, at this point, and he's, he still has autism, and he still has ADHD, and he's still very learning disabled. And, and but but he's on a he's on a developmental timetable. It'll be somewhat different. But his, his development in the last six years has been phenomenal. And I think it's not an accident that, it's, that, that they, they decided, let's not fight him all the time. Let's stop that. Let, let's work with his energy. And, uh, and let, let's offer help and not try to force it down his throat. And, and absolutely, uh, and certainly with kids, my own son had ADHD and got a PhD in psychology with, with absolutely no academic pressure at all. 
from me. He had, he had tutoring because he also had some, some learning problems. And I'd offer to help. And at various times, he'd, 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 he'd accept my, my help. Uh, or he'd, he'd want his mom to sit and do balance a checkbook while he did his math work or something. But absolutely, it's just it's just harder uh, b- because we, 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 we they need help. And our, and our, our inclination is that we, we have to force it on them whether they want it or not. And my feeling is, for the most part, unless you have kids that are really severe problems where you're just kind of you're fighting for survival, that, that, we, that it's supporting the sense of control is, 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 is as equally helpful and equally important. Ah, oh, yes, absolutely. The other day I have um, one kid who's, one of my kids who is neurodivergent was trying to remember um, like she had an appointment and she needed to bring papers with her and she was like, Oh, how am I going to remember what stuff to bring? And I, I remember I just sort of casually offered, Oh, well, just so you know, when I schedule an appointment where I have to bring something with me, I write out what I have to bring in the memo of the event in the calendar. And that's how I remember to bring it. And she was like, Oh, okay. It, it, it's like, it's sort of like a collection of a lot of little things like that, of like offering help offering ideas offering support or like oh i've read with people who experience the world you know the way you do they find this thing helpful so you know well, you may want to try that that it's it's it, that that phrasing like that is so different than telling you you should do this or you should do this just that simple yeah. we're working on it we're just finishing a second book on, on talking with kids the, the working title is um, what do you say and in a large part of it is that how do you how do you skillfully impart your wisdom and your experience, and just in just exactly the way you suggested, Rachel. Um, ah. And uh, well, thank you, and I'm very excited to read this book. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and, I, well, I'll, I'll just very very quickly say that, that years ago, I, I I tested this girl when she was five who was diagnosed with autism. And I didn't see her again for 11 and a half years. And I felt kind of badly because I I, I thought about her a lot. And uh, and I thought, well, they must have used somebody else. They must have gotten somebody else. So I see her. I, I, I go out to see her. She's on my calendar. I'm happy to see her. I go out to get her in the waiting room. And she's 16 and a half. And she, she turns, she shakes my hand. And she said, I bet you can tell I've really been working on making eye contact. <laughs> so, well, yeah, first thing I noticed. But, uh, but so I, I talked to the parents. I say, why has it been 11? Why haven't I seen you in 11 and a half years? He said, well, in the report, you suggested just think out loud. Just talk to her about the world and about the way you perceive it. And here's what I think is happening here. What do you see? That's, that's all we needed. And she's, she, she graduated mm-hmm. from college. She's, she's an artist, brilliant artist, um, and still quirky socially. But yeah. just, just it, it's so much. As, as Ned says, it's not the what, it's the how. And, and so much of the, the skillfulness is, is offering, not forcing. Oh, that's Ned, beautiful. Ned, 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 you pick it up, buddy. Well, yeah, no, just, you know, I want, it's so easy to think, well, this doesn't apply to, kid, to, to my kid or this kid or this type of kid, right? And, you know, certainly there are enormous differences in the abilities and the skills and the traits the kid has, you know, of their their tolerance for stress or their executive functions, their raw IQ, so on and so forth. But we want to remember that a huge amount of this literature about how important a sense of control is, both to stress tolerance and to motivation, is based on animals much less sophisticated, no matter who your kid is. You may think he acts and eats like an animal, but, but <laughs> let's, let's be fair. Let me give, give the kids too, right? So I was just rereading there. People um, may know the concept of learned helplessness. And so this is Steve Mayer, whose work we talk about in the book. And, and he worked, worked, did this work with Martin Seligman before he ran off to um, sort of establish uh, positive psychology at, at University of Pennsylvania. And so there's a really uh, sort of important paper called uh, Learned Helplessness at 50 or at 50 years, I forget the exact title. And he, he, said, he said, we made a profound mistake in that it wasn't that these animals learned helplessness is that they failed to learn a sense of control. Mm-hmm. And this, so this is just incredibly important for every child, for every family, for every community, because we certainly know there are communities who, 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 who have every, every disadvantage and every headwind on, on top of it. And that in order for all of us, and especially children, to develop this motivation, they need to learn a sense of control. So it isn't wired in them, right? They, they need to have the opportunities to do this. And so 
if you have a kid who has every struggle in the world cognitively, emotionally, let's not add to that by depriving him or her of the opportunity to learn a sense of control without which how could he possibly be develop stress tolerance and how could he possibly develop intrinsic motivation? Oh, yes. I remember reading a study and I can't remember who it was or where it came from, but um, about like where, when someone is experiencing a significant trauma or, you know, someone's a refugee or even long-term, long-term sort of traumatic experiences. One of the key differences in their outcome is, did they feel like they had a sense of control during that traumatic experience? Well, yep. it's just, yeah, it's, it's just completely huge, you know, and, and the, 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 the classic set of experiments that really put a sense of control on the map that, that, that done by the Steve Mayer that, that Ned mentioned, that there's rat A and rat B, and they're both in this plexiglass cages with their tail outside the, the cage and a wheel in the cage, and, and they get a shock in their tail. And it's not a real painful shock, but it's annoying, and they want to stop it. And rat A turns the wheel and finds that the stock shops. The, the shock stops. Rat B turns the wheel, nothing happens. Rat A learns that he can control stressful situations. Rat A, when he's stressed, the prefrontal cortex activates, dampens down the stress response, he goes into coping mode. Rat B doesn't have that sense of control, feel, just gets stressed and just kind of gives up or just feels, feels overwhelmed and, and kind of shuts down. And we, so, which is why, I mean, four of the, the four implications of this idea of thinking about yourself more as a consultant to your kid than your kid's manager or boss. One, one is we offer help, not try to force it down their throat. We offer our wisdom, experience, and advice, but we don't try to tell a kid a million times or just keep telling them. We, we encourage kids to make their own decisions, and we require teenagers to make important decisions about their own life so they have plenty of practice running their own life before they go up to college. And fourth is we want kids as much as possible to solve their own problems. If they're really upset about something, we, 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 want, we, want, to offer, we want to offer it to our support. But we, we don't want to jump in and say, you should do this or this or this, because that, that, that's not, they don't, then they don't learn how to do it themselves. And yes, I'm noticing and I'm wondering are like some of my favorite like sentence starters where it's yeah. like, I'm noticing that you're having a hard time with such and such. I'm wondering if you have any ideas about how I can help you with that or whatever. Well, uh, that's that's the kind of language, language we have in our second book right here. Uh, so. <laughs> and that would get you to your point about refugees, you know, that, that in a terrible, terrible situation, I will be incredibly grateful for anyone who saves me. And that will help me feel safe in that moment. But it won't make me feel brave about the future because I haven't had the experience of being able of having the, the opportunity or the tools to, to save myself. I'll have to constantly look for someone else to come and to come and make me feel safe. And this is the same thing with our kids, right? If they can extricate themselves or figure out even if it's a suboptimal solution to a problem, so long as it is a solution to the problem, it again is wiring that prefrontal cortex to regulate the stress response and make them feel more brave going into future situations, even if they're messy. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, one of one of my favorite quotes from the book is when Bill's kids were in elementary school, he made a point of telling them that there was a low correlation between grades in school and success in life. He said that while he would look at their report cards if they wanted him to, he was much more concerned about their development as students and as people. There exists a fallacy that the singular path to success includes high grades, top test scores, and a prestigious college education, but the data does not support that conclusion, right? Can you yep. help us break down that myth in favor of like trusting and empowering each person to consciously design their own path to success as they define it? Yeah. Well, probably the, the, the place that I start is, is just that um, only about a third of adults get a college degree. And we are talking about two thirds of the population on welfare, which means that, that most of the vast majority of Americans who make a living and, and, and develop a life even without a college degree. Secondly, the, the research on valedictorians suggested that they aren't more successful than other people by the time that they're 26 or 27, although they're good college students. Because it's, it's a very different skill set, creating a life, yes. that, creating a successful life than trying to be equally good at everything in school. And most adults, uh, most successful adults, they're good at some things and they suck at everything. 
And if you try, if you try to be, they try, they suck at some things. And if you try to be a straight A student, you're trying not to suck at anything. And it's just right. so it's a very different skill set. And so we, we have a we have a chapter uh, in the last two chapters in the book. One is called "Who's Ready for College," and it's in part about how how what a brain toxic environment college campuses are, especially in the first couple of years, and wanting kids to really be ready, to know what they're getting into to go there. And the last chapter is called Alternate Roots. And it's about all the people, this bunch of people we know who have very successful lives, who either didn't go to college or got, got through college, very circuitous roots, people like me who flunked out of graduate school the first time I tried it um, and eventually landed on our feet. But we, we try to give, we want kids to have a much broader sense of how you can make a contribution in this world how you can make a living, how you can how you can develop a meaningful life without thinking the only path is being a top student, going to a top college, going to a top law school, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's a path, but not the one well, and only path. Well, and you just you know, we we, we were at, we were in, in Palo Alto uh, a year ago, and um, and the, the 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 week we were there lecturing uh, the, the week before. Two undergraduates at Stanford had committed suicide, and one one, one mm-hmm. had been an Olympic champion. And, and it, the, the increase in suicide, we were, we were talking with, with one of the world's experts on childhood depression and anxiety disorders a couple weeks ago, Danny Pine at the NIMH. And we, I, we're, Danny was saying, well, it's really hard to tell, really, in ter- is there actually... A, a, a huge epidemic in anxiety and depression. He said, there's, there's biases in the way these things are assessed. He said, what, what's incontrovertible now is this dramatic increase in suicide, completed suicides in young people. And, 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 so, and, and many of these, we're talking about a lot of high achieving young people. And so if, yeah. if people grow up the idea that there's a very, no, very narrow path to success, and if I ever fall off, less than perfect, and my life is, is, is not meaningful, it's not a very, uh, it doesn't have very good prognosis. Mm. Okay, well, standardized tests and colleges are not the only path to success. They are a path to success for a fair amount of people. And yeah. as homeschoolers, the SAT might be their first experience taking a standardized test. Do you have any advice for helping our children through this experience while still honoring their ownership of the journey? Yeah, um, we first of all actually we, <laughs> we have a chapter in our book uh, with a with a lovely title. We our our, our assistant uh, a- agent uh, made up the title. This is important, so people pay close attention to this: the SAT, ACT, and other four letter words. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, there's there's a lot. I mean, you know, we can you can really nerd out about. Um, you know, about kind of what good test prep looks like. Um, uh, but, but ultimately, it's the same, it's the same kind of principles that apply that, you know, we want to offer help, we want to provide resources if we can, if, and if kids want them, but to not force it on them. And a lot of times, parents will try to help with that. And if you know, if it's possible to get them with with a with a class or a tutor or Khan Academy, um, you know, or, or doing this with a friend, um, generally I've, I've rarely seen work well with parents getting sort of deeply involved in test prep. Um, and ultimately I would say, you know, if, if kids don't want to do, I mean, if a kid doesn't want to do test prep, you, you, you've come to the right, um, pandemic global virus, uh, you know, <laughs> because everyone in the world has basically gone test score optional. But, you know, I have a, there's a story that I think will show up in our second book where I've been working with these twins, um, for, uh, fraternal twins, um, one girl is incredibly academic. She like lead, reads, you know, 18th century Russian history for for fun. And apparently, though, I'm not sure she understands what fun actually is, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and her sister, who is who's this who's this artist, and just ha- you know, and kind of it feels everything deeply, intensely, and so she's anxious, she's depressed, she's just she's a complicated kid right now. And she's not as overtly academic as her sister, and and she's constantly reminded of that by her sister and her parents. Whoops. Mm. So we were doing, we're probably three weeks into this, and she stopped. She said, can I ask a question? I said, sure. He said, do I have to take this test? I said, no, absolutely not. Tell me tell me again the schools you're looking at. We pulled immediately up online all the colleges that she was looking at, and they were test score optional. 
and her grades were good enough and, and, and. I said, no, no, so you absolutely do not have to take this. If you want to quit right here and now and tell your parents to put that money into spending account, I'm all for that. <laughs> I said, but I'll tell you why. I said, I would like you to take this. I, I want you to take this, and here's why. Because when kids are anxious, we know that the dominant manifestation of anxiety is avoidance. And that makes sense, mm -hmm. because if the things that feel scary to us, they could be life-threatening to us, we sure are going to avoid things that could, could threaten our lives. But when we're anxious, we overreact to things. The intensity of our, of our stress is not an accuracy of, of, of how dangerous they actually are. And so the problem that happens when we're anxious is that over time, unless we're really treating that anxiety, the world in which we feel safe to operate gets smaller and smaller and narrower and narrower. I said, I don't want that for you. I said, so for me, this is the best opportunity because you can work really hard at this stupid test and if you do well, woohoo, make your parents take you out for ice cream. I'll take you out for ice cream, right? <laughs> and if you don't, it doesn't matter. Because we already looked at, we looked at our whole profile, all the schools you want to get, you can already get into students. So absolutely no, you, you don't have to do this at all. And so she and I were, were sort of buds for, you know, three months of doing this. And she got a score that was well above what she needed, well above, well above where she started. It was a point short of where she wanted to be. But it was it was this marvelous experience because, you know, she she, you know, she kind of went into the cave and she didn't actually slay the dragon, though he was, you know, going to expire soon enough because she stabbed him pretty good. <laughs> right. And so 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 there's I mean, we have a whole chapter about this. And for some kids, you know, it's the easiest thing. Just don't care about the stupid test and apply to college with all the other ways that make you wonderful. For some kids, it's a great opportunity. I think it, it goes back to. Um, having this, having kids be at the center of their own education, including tests, and then mom and dad support, however is appropriate, you know, have a tutor like me support, however is appropriate. But I'm always getting emails and calls and texts from parents saying, we never could have done this without you. And I, and I bat it back every single time. I said, nope, nope, you earn this. <laughs> You were in this. I was there to help, and I'm just a little bit of a tour guide. But but this is your victory, and I think I think that's um. And the last thing I'll say on that is there's there's a we talk in the book about a group called Fair Test, um, that holds the you know at this point 1,500 colleges and universities their test score optional. Because one of the most helpful things to lower stress is to have a plan B. And so if you know I want to work really hard at this test or my dream apply early decision, my dream college, fantastic. But to know that if you don't get into Harvard, you can go to Harvard. If you don't get into Harvard, if you can go to Hamilton. I'm now ranking these things. And, and all the way down, there, that there's a, there's a place for every kid that will be, you know, where you can learn and grow. And, and it's, not, it's not Yale or McDonald's. Yes. Oh, all of that was so helpful. There's a place for every kid. Yes, I love that. All right, let's move into our deep dive. The show notes can be found at rachelrainbolt.com slash podcast 53, where you can also subscribe and get future show notes sent right to your inbox. Ned, because we lost Bill, <laughs> his call dropped. What are your favorite resources for people to dive deeper into this topic? And of course, we're going to start with the self-driven child book. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, we're you know we think everyone the, the, we think it's a you know solid book. It's a good coaster, if nothing else. Uh, you know, we have a uh, we have a, a Facebook group um, where Bill and I hang out every week and talk about what we're working on in the book and answer questions that folks have. So it's just self driven child on on Facebook. Um, gosh, like uh, other books to read, other resources. Uh, what, what specific angle? Yeah, anything that you guys want to share or anything that you think would really benefit, particularly, I guess, considering the fact that most of the people listening are homeschoolers. Has there, has there, well, are there any like books I, or any I or love resources Blake, or I, people? I love Blake Bowles' new book, but I think you already interviewed him. I think he's just, <laughs> he's just, gosh, he came through on his, on his um, aborted bike ride. He was trying to, you know, and, and he came through DC and we went, I finally got to put a, a face with a name. Uh, he's terrific. Um uh gosh I, Matt oh Bill you're back I am yeah my, my <laughs> phone died I, it's, so, oh, no. <laughs> I, I've got a myriad of, myriad of problems here but uh yeah about that. so, so we're, we're talking about resources yep talking about resources for, for, yeah. for folks who are for for, for, for yeah and, I, and I'm embarrassed to say I mean we we, we 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 do a lot we've done a lot of podcasts we have a lot scheduled for, for, for homeschooling communities um, that it be, because this idea of, of self 
the self drive is so important for kids in homeschooling. They, they don't have a teacher yes. with, with carrots and sticks and, and this and that. It's so important that I think the theme is really resonating. But I, I I don't know the homeschooling literature very well, and certainly I I, I know some of the unschooling literature, and, and we, we support um, we we support anything that um, you know any any means of educating kids that that. Uh, that get kids educated that, that that is not highly stressful and it's enjoyable. Mm. And I, I I offered to homeschool my own kids um, every year. I was the, the idea of being able to stay home with them and teach them and and uh, learn stuff and then <laughs> along with them it always sounded so fun to me. And and, and I've I've disabused m- many of my colleagues over the years of, of the idea that somehow the only way you can develop socially is being in school. And because so many kids that I see that that that, 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 that social interactions in school are very negative and, and really harmful mm-hmm. to them, uh, but in, in try, but I don't know that the the literature very well on, on homeschooling, and so it's it's so funny that you because I know your book is not about homeschooling; it's really from within the traditional schooling paradigm, and yet it is one of the most popular books in the unschooling homeschooling. Culture. It's a book that is always on people's like top recommendation list of books. It's in my homeschooling canon, you know, the book recommendations that I make for other people. So I just want to say thank you for making this book that resonates so profoundly with all of us over over here, even though, you know, you guys didn't write it from within that perspective. Well, you know, it's a it's a really good it's a really good point, Rachel. And I was re- reflecting on this a little bit earlier T- today. Um, you know, we have occasionally had folks say, well, what, what do you do if we support all of this stuff? What do you do? If your kid's school, blah, right, does this stuff. Like, I mean, how can you how can you fight City Hall? How can you fix this, right? And you know, we have a pretty good non-answer on that one too. I'm teasing a little bit, but 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 honest to gosh, the 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 the, the science and the lessons and, and what we hope is is solid advice in the self-driven child, I think is so much more practicable for folks who are homeschooling because it's really about the relationship that they have with their kids and their kids being at the center of their own learning and how parents are helping that. Because because that's basically it, right? It's the parents, it's the kid, and then it's whatever resources they have. They're not, <laughs> they're not- We're behold- free to apply it fully. Right, you're not beholden yes. to, to some school system that's doing things that, that, that aren't based in science to, to some teacher who, to, who, who you, to whom you can't appeal, who's completely off the rails. You're not, you're not stuck. And so you talk about a sense of control it all resides within the family, and so so if people are, are are if that's where they are, and they're and they're and they're on for this grand adventure, because with 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 all the sense of control, it's also a heck of a lot of responsibility, and that takes a lot of energy and courage that a lot of families just aren't prepared to do. It's just easier to throw their kids into into local public school and 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 you know cross you know cross their fingers and maybe hold their nose from time to time. It's a huge amount of work and a, and, a, and a great leap of faith, I think, for families to do that but if if they're if they're if they're down with that my gosh you is you know you, you know until until this covid thing you can do whatever you want you can do you know <laughs> that education can be exactly what you and your kids and your family make it and so i i really do think that this book that the self driven child it's it, it's such it's in some ways it's such more of an opportunity for folks who are homeschooling than are in the traditional schools well the, <sighs> that's a good point even even just Certainly, most of the public school, most of the private school programs too. You know, the, the the major things they use are are, are rewards and negative consequences. If, if, if you, uh, you know, you're graded out, if you don't turn something in, or this or that, and um, and th- things we know just undermine intrinsic motivation. And just just pe- yeah. piggybacking what you're saying, Ned, you, you don't have to do that. You know, and, and and you can actually apply what we know. It, it helps kids develop. And you know, my, my kids—they wanted to be. They—they they liked going to school. They had their friends. They had nice teachers. A very nurturing school. They liked it. But I see so many kids whose school just tears them apart. And I, when I see this, I pray to God that one of the options is to educate the kid at home. I, I, uh. Bill, Bill and I have a mutual student, uh, mutual client. Um, the story about this being our second book, and. <laughs> Very complicated family situation we'll get into, but at some point during her junior, maybe beginning of her senior year, I asked her, what do you enjoy most about school? What's your favorite class? 
and her face sort of her eyes, all the light left her eyes. And she looked at me and she said, I don't do anything except for the purpose of getting a grade. None of this matters mm-hmm. to me. And I thought, mm-hmm. what a colossal, and this is a kid in a very Tony independent school in DC. And I thought, what a colossal waste of four years of your life. Oh. <laughs> right. Well, it's true. And, and that, that uh, book by Benice Pope Clark, or Clark Pope, I can't mm-hmm. remember which one it is, called Doing School, mm-hmm. where she, she, she spent a year with these five, she asked high school principals in, 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 the, in, in, the, in Silicon Valley to, to, to suggest, I wanted to follow five kids, and to, uh, not just kids who were just brainiacs and straight students, but kids who were well rounded kids. And all these kids, he said, we're just doing school. All, all we think about is grades. We just don't do anything. It's exactly the same thing you said, Ned. And these are the most kind of well-adjusted, ba- balanced kids. And so, so much of school is, is completely toxic. And, and certainly all the, innov- and all the innovations that have happened in school, all the changes in school, the, the public schools that have happened in the last, certainly the last 15 years, have been implemented by politicians who either, either they don't know anything about brain development or they don't care. Yes. So, I mean, I, I think that that, uh, you know, when <laughs> the, the chapter about called taking t- taking a sense of control to school, you know, parents can actually uh, apply that that stuff at at home I mean, in, in terms of the pacing of instruction. You don't have to te- you don't have to teach algebra to a kid who's in sixth grade. You can wait till they're a little bit more mature and teach them when they're ready. Yes, my eight year old is choosing to use this reading curriculum right now, and there's this practice sheet that's full of like words and phrases that he's quote unquote, supposed to read through before he starts reading the story. And he started reading it and felt annoyed by it and put it down and said, do I have to read this before we read the story? And I said, well, I don't know. Do you find it helpful to review the words and phrases before you read the story? Well, I don't know. Is it helpful? Well, let's try it. Like, so we, you know, read the, the very next story without the practice sheet and the one after with the practice sheet and discuss it. And I'm just sitting there thinking like, this is the meat of homeschooling to me. Like it's not about this curriculum per se or this reading or that he knows how to spell this word. Like that's not that's not the meat of it for me. It's that he learns how to engage in this process of learning and that he'll be able to do that for the rest of his life. That, that's, that's just that's just perfect. And so much of what we talk about in the first book and the second book too is when if we if we think something would be good for a kid and the kid disagrees, we say, would you be willing to do a little experiment and see? You could do do it your way for a week. My and then you're, you're the expert on you. We want you to decide. Uh, but uh, that's perfect. Oh, Bill and Ned, thank you so much for sharing this conversation with me. I'm like tingly with excitement over how <laughs> awesome it was. And I'm, I mean, I'm even, I hate editing these. That's like the, my least favorite part. And I'm even looking forward to editing this so I can just listen back to it again. So I know there were some technical um, difficulties in the beginning there, but thank you so much for hanging in and for showing up and for engaging in this conversation with me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your patience with us. It's a lovely, lovely conversation. Yeah, I'm sure we wouldn't be the first ones to say you're really fun to talk to. Oh, well, thank you. (laughs) 